Thank you very much, and uh, great to be here with you today. Uh, I am uh, Swedish, Sweden's Arctic ambassador, so I work at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Stockholm, and uh, I have the two last years been the chairman of the Arctic Council, uh, which I will come back to. Uh, I will try to give you a picture now in half an hour, sort of broadly, uh, about the Arctic and how it is changing, adding one or two stories uh, on my own experience from there. But I will begin with a survey. Has any of you been on the North Pole? Have you been on the North Pole? Yes. Yeah. How did you get there? I was on Erasmus in Finland, so we had to do that. And you went up to the North Pole, that's impressive. How many of you have lived north of the Arctic Circle? Have you been to Obisko, I heard? Uh, so you tell everyone what this, what this is, when you sort of swallowed your falafel. <laughs> yeah, what well, is Yes. It's the uh, Amistad National Park. And um, what is this uh, formation La in the background? La I don't know uh, if there is an English word for it. Sami Gate, perhaps, <laughs> or... <Something like> that. <laughs> I don't know. Anybody else north, live north of the Arctic Circle? And you from where? Uh, well, I'm from Sommer, but I, I stayed in Kirna for a while. Okay, ah, that's good. And one more? Ah, we are a southern group. Okay, let's try this one. How many of you have indigenous background, for example, Sami, Inuit, or Nenets? No one. That would have been somewhat different if we were in Kiruna, uh, I guess, or somewhere else. But it's always good to know uh, sort of the people you are speaking to or with, because then I can sort of use your experiences too, uh, relating to different issues. I will start with just look at how we usually see the world. And this is basically what we learn in school, isn't it? But maps are rather interesting because, of course, they project something of the world. Uh, here, of course, it's very centered on the Mediterranean. Uh, you have areas sort of very far south and north, rather much periphery, and sort of east and west also periphery. And interesting thing with the Arctic, if you look up there, it's like a medieval map. It's not there at all. And there is an edge, so it's more or less, if you move north, you fall over the edge. And it's the end of the world uh, up there. And this is pretty much how people have seen the Arctic and Antarctica. Just to say it's a huge continent down there, which is not on the map at all. But historically, uh, not so much has been going on in the Arctic in the view so many. We have had wildlife there, uh, not huge. We have had polar explorers. Uh, from different countries uh, moving up there. We have had a small population and not much activity. People haven't cared so much about the Arctic. But there's been a huge change in that the latest years. Uh, and perhaps that's why you are all here and I have the work I have. So perhaps we have to look at the Arctic in a different way. And this is, of course, if you look uh, from the top of the world down, and suddenly things look a little bit different. You see Russia is huge. Anyone from Russia here? Ah, good. You are absolutely huge. Uh, you are the biggest country in the world, and in the Arctic you are sort of half of the Arctic. And then, anyone from, Green, from Denmark? No Danes. And Denmark is usually a rather small place, but here, Greenland, wow. And then one from Canada. No Canadians? And Canada, you know, is the second biggest country in the world. Uh, and it has a huge north. So it's an, another way of looking at things. And it's also a way to show how you can define the Arctic. There are sort of different ways to look at what is the Arctic. If you are in the natural sciences, you see more at how warm it is. Uh, and if you have a 10 centigrade medium in the summer, uh, you get a line like this. Of course, it upsets me since Sweden is not within the Arctic then. The more politically accepted definition is that you follow the Arctic Circle. And the Arctic Circle is, of course, only a line 
where north of it you have midnight sun in the summer or complete darkness in the winter. But that is how politically the Arctic Council has been founded, that you follow this line uh, around the world. And the reason, of course, that the Arctic has a lot of focus now is that there are a number of different drivers of change. The most important one is the global warming. And global warming affects the Arctic so much more than other regions. And you can see it more clearly in the Arctic compared to other regions. If you have freak storms over New York or the Philippines, it is likely uh, that it has something to do with climate change. But if you look at this, these two photos of ice in September on the North Pole, which is when you have the ice minimum, you see it is a huge change uh, from 1980 to last year when it, we had an ice minimum. Uh, and suddenly you see Arctic uh, is very much open for activity. You see northern Russia, uh, suddenly you have a coast which is sort of completely open for traffic where it has been locked in uh, all year round earlier. And this is of course summer. Uh, in the winter uh, you have a lot of ice. In 30 to 40 years, uh, the scientists say that the Arctic, the ice cap will completely disappear in the summer. Of course there will be ice in the winter. <coughs> so it is a rapid change and due to different reasons the Arctic heats twice as fast as the gl global average heating. So when you have the climate negotiations like in Warsaw, was it two weeks ago, you talk about the two degree target, but if you have a two degree target for the entire world, you will have four degrees uh, warming in the Arctic. And uh, it is very clear what is happening. This is sort of the Atlantic Ocean example, but also if we come closer to home uh, and you go up to Sulitelma Massive and the largest glacier we have in Sweden, or actually we have it together with Norway and the Norwegians here. No. Uh, you see up here uh, we have a glacier which has been researched for a long time. Uh, in 1807 it looked like this. I especially like the small Arctic explorers there to the left. You see, with a hat, hat like this uh, out exploring. It's the age before uh, modern well, uh, clothing, so to say. So this was 1807. And then 1897, 97. You see, actually, the glacier has expanded and become much bigger. But, last year, you see, this is the same mountain top here, so it's completely moved back uh, over here. So the Swedish glaciers are melting due to climate change too. Another factor that affects the north more on the land with climate change is permafrost. And here you see how permafrost we have in different regions of the Arctic. Uh, not so heavy in northern Sweden, but if you see northern Russia and northern Canada, it is a lot of permafrost high percentages and it's a lot of them ice mixed up with the soil. And so the permafrost, it's a mix of uh, ice and soil. If you go up north to Kiruna, well, in Sweden call it Kjæle, uh, and you take uh, like a rod and put it down, it suddenly hits the ice and it's like concrete. And in many regions in the Arctic you build houses on the permafrost. Uh, so if you go see a building in northern Canada, it stands on different sort of legs or whatever you call it. Uh, because if it's flat on the ground it would melt the permafrost. Pipelines are built sort of on the permafrost uh, with cooling, uh, things that are cooling the, the legs it's standing on, uh, and so on, because you don't want it uh, to melt. But if the permafrost and the permafrost is melting, oh, this must be an Arctic storm coming in or something, <laughs> or the ventilation uh, switched on a little bit too late. 
Okay. Uh, the problem is here, of course, you have this mix of ice and soil. And if it melts, it both emits methane, uh, which is, of course, uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, and you have cave-ins. Uh, so if you build infrastructure on permafrost, you might have problems in the long run. You might also have problems like this. This is outside Arby School, so perhaps, I don't know if you know this, uh, lake, uh, or former lake. But it had always been a lake here, but it was permafrost under it. The permafrost thawed, uh, and it was like pulling a plug out of a bathtub, and the water disappeared. Uh, so now we have a former lake outside Abisko. Uh, it is not so common in Sweden, but in Russia you see this much more. Uh, so then you might have a problem also with the sweet water access for the people living there if they depend on these different lakes. So this is something about warming and the effects you see uh, in the environment in the Arctic region. Warming is not only driver of change in the Arctic is also high resource prices, globalization and internet uh, has been very important, how people have, have been very isolated, sort of come in contact with the rest of the world. Uh, you see a number of different effects due to this. Uh, and one is of course that wildlife is hit by the warming. Sometimes people have the image of there is not much wildlife in the Arctic. There are a number of species and they are very specialized for life in the extreme cold and on the ice pack. And for example, the polar bear, which is always the symbol, and I guess it's because World Wildlife Fund always campaigns with the polar bear. The polar bear was threatened in the 1970s until 1973. There was an international treaty in the middle of the Cold War to protect the polar bear. So we have around 20, 25,000 polar bears today. So you only have quotas now when you hunt polar bears. But uh, polar bears, sort of their normal life is in the summer on the ice where they hunt seals and they eat a lot and get fat. And they go up in the, on land and have their children or carry what to make, give birth uh, in the winter and then eat on the ice cap in the summer again. What will happen is the ice cap disappears. Obviously, we will see a lot of less polar bears, unfortunately, the coming years. Uh, so there will be fewer and fewer on them and also risk of them mating with brown bears and others. So polar bears are threatened by this change but also walruses, uh, different whales and so on. But there will be winners also, less ice, other whales. Uh, so there are some whales will do better and some will do worse uh, with the climate change. <coughs> the smelting Arctic, as you saw, has opened up uh, the Arctic Ocean for different activities and shipping is an important one. Uh, the distance between Rotterdam and Yokohama is 40% shorter if you go on the, the northeast passage north of Russia compared to going through the Suez Canal. There are no pirates uh, in the northern uh, version as it is outside Somalia. So there is a possibility that uh, the Arctic will change global logistics when it comes to transport. Uh, and there is also, you can go to the Northwest Passage, but that's a little bit more difficult, so people see that a little bit, little bit more in the future. Despite that it's so much shorter, it's not much traffic in the Northeast Passage yet. Uh, this year, up till now, we have, have only 72 ships that have passed. The Suez Canal, you have 19,000 uh, every year, so that's just another ball game completely. Uh, but uh, the Russia is investing a lot in developing the Northeast Passage because it's a, you need a lot to make it a viable route. You need more navigation support, better communication, search and rescue capacity, and so. So they put a big emphasis on this. And the reason for Russia is not only that they like to the transit passage, but a lot of Russian resources can be found in the north, so they need to ship that out. And that's obviously similar also to Sweden. A lot of our resources are found in the north. The iron mine in Kiruna, which produces 90 to 95% of all iron ore in Europe. 
uh, that is shipped out through Narvik and some through Luleå. Uh, so there is a similarity in this. So you will see more shipping in the Arctic in the future. Uh, Stena Bulk, which is a Gothenburg company, this uh, only two months ago, they worked together with a South Korean uh, company, Hyundai, and with a shipment through the Northeast Passage. I know they used it seven times. There is a company with the name Marinvest, also from Gothenburg, I think gone through seven times. So, so it, it is picking up, people are looking at it. Uh, but not huge increase yet. But it's also in other places around the world people are looking at it. Anyone from China here? Okay, uh, this is a, a Chinese map. Uh, it's also interesting how you sort of mix perspectives uh, here, what is center uh, and how to move uh, transport to different uh, places of the world. But obviously China is a big exporting company. How many percent of your exports, or how much percent of your exports is on sea, do you know that? No? Uh, but you need to get equipment, uh, consumer products and other things to the European and American markets and of course which way to go? Uh, you can go south, uh, <coughs> Malacca Strait, uh, Suez, uh, or you can even go past Africa if there are problems or it looks somewhat shorter here if you use uh, go through the Arctic. So different actors around the world are looking at this and showing interest all the way down to Singapore, uh, India also, uh, and so Just to show uh, sort of my own experience, I was on a conference cruise arranged by <coughs> the Russian Security Council two years ago. We left uh, around Narian Mar, which I think is around the N in Arkhangelsk. And we went to Tixi, which is <coughs> around the Lena River outlet. And this was in August. Uh, and of course, with the nuclear icebreakers, uh, two reactors, this is one of the sort of heaviest ships you can find. But you are pretty safe if there, are ice, there is ice. But the problem is, we didn't see any ice. So around, I think it's a Bolshevik island there where I put the green star or south of which, the international guests on this conference start to ask, uh, is there no ice? So they made a little tour up north uh, of it, and the ice we saw was only flake ice. Uh, this is an icebreaker, Yamal. Uh, so only flake ice, uh, and no sort of solid ice pack. And this was 2011, uh, and of course this was one of the topics of this conference to discuss uh, shipping in the Arctic and uh, north of Russia. Another economic issue, uh, which is a sort of perhaps the one which is most debated about in the Arctic, concerns uh, different natural resources and exploitation of it, and especially oil exploitation. <coughs> this is a pipeline in Northern America. If you look at where the oil and gas is situated, you see there are different fields uh, here around north of Russia, north of Canada, Alaska, and around Greenland. Uh, and obviously there are uh, interests among the Arctic coastal states for this, of all the different coastal states even are doing, are exploit or sort of studying the ways of uh, getting to the gas. It's only Norway and Russia which are actually drilling and producing gas in the Arctic. And this is a very hotly debated issue, as you know. We all remember the Deepwater Horizon accident in the Mexican Gulf and the extreme difficulties it was to stop it. And the Mexican Gulf is a part of the world where we have a lot of maritime infrastructure, a lot of ships, and so on. In the Arctic, it is very isolated, there are few ships, and so on. And what would happen if there would be an accident in the Arctic? And the problem is, of course, that oil that is emitted, that it's stuck in ice, is very difficult first to know where it is, and it's very difficult uh, to combat it and sort of get rid of it. You use chemicals, for example, in warm water, uh, that is more difficult if it's stuck in ice, if you don't get the chemicals under, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, other measures are much, much more difficult. 
So that is one of the issues. The other issue is, of course, the use of oil uh, and that it is driving uh, climate change. So there are sort of two different aspects of oil exploitation in the Arctic. What is interesting to know, though, is that some people say that oil is driving conflict in the Arctic, but as you see, most of it is rather close to the shores in the economic zones of these different countries. So it's rather clear which country controlled the oil that is to be found. This is just a statistical map which is based on figures from the US saying that there are 13% of the undiscovered oil can be found in the Arctic and 13 of the undiscovered oil and 30 of the undiscovered gas. But even though it's sort of statistically likely that there should be gas uh, or oil east, west of Greenland, uh, the Scottish company Cairns drilled there and found nothing. So uh, statistics and reality are sometimes different. There are people living in the Arctic too. Uh, and uh, just to show the populations, the biggest city is Murmansk. Are you from Murmansk? Moscow? Moscow over there, good. Uh, so the biggest population in the Arctic is the Russian population north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, if you see at Canada, which is northern Canada is as big as Europe, there's a population of 130,000. Uh, so northern Sweden, which we usually think is rather not so heavily populated, it's like Holland, uh, which is obviously very heavily populated compared to northern Canada and uh, well, northern Russia, most of it. It is very desolate and of course this affects the people uh, living there and how you build the infrastructure and other things. Another part which is interesting is that there are also indigenous populations in all different parts of the Arctic except Iceland. If you see Greenland, it is around 85% with Inuit background. Uh, if we know Sweden, for example, uh, the Sami population, uh, there are different figures there, but some say 20,000, some say 60,000. Uh, and in the Russia, you see the Nenets and others. Canada, big Inuit group also. And indigenous peoples, of course, have specific backgrounds and specific rights under international law and national law in our different countries. So this is often an aspect uh, to be aware of. This is some Russian indigenous people I met on the Russian tundra. In Sweden uh, we have the Sami, of course, is the biggest uh, group. What can I say more about Arctic and people? Uh, many parts of the northern parts of our countries uh, well, it, it, there's a difference. I would say in northern Scandinavia, you have people are healthy and employed uh, and pretty much like the rest of your population in our countries. But in the other, in Russia, for example, and in, in Canada, you see more uh, people not as healthy in the north and then bigger unemployment and such. So this is an important issue also for all the different Arctic Council to address. How do we get the people being there to have a good and positive future? and sort of to get the balance right between economic development and respect of the environment uh, and the culture and everything up north. I also wanted to come in and talk a little bit about security. Uh, I'm an international lawyer in, in my background. Uh, I have focused on security policy. And the reason is for that is that you sometimes read that there is a sort of big conflicts going on in the Arctic. Some people talk about the new Cold War. It's always fun, you know, cold Arctic. Yeah. Or otherwise you always say the Arctic is hot, you know, warming, cold, hot. Uh, this is uh, the Nagurskoye uh, Russian, uh, but not the Russian examples here today. Uh, uh, it's a border uh, uh, protection uh, building in Franz Josef Land, uh, which is northwest of Svalbard. Uh, and in here, there are around 50 people uh, with their families living all year round. Uh, so this is the most, sort of, most northern part of Russia. Uh, and of course, you can say, what are they protecting the Russian border from? Not much up there. Uh, and there is not much up there yet. 
But the issue is, of course, as you saw in the map earlier, suddenly we have northern coasts in our country, which has been sort of ice all the way in, not very much traffic or anything. But when the ice recedes and you have open sea, suddenly you can get traffic. And it, when you have uncontrolled borders and other things, you will get smuggling, you can get uh, trafficking uh, and illegal fishing and so on. So the different Arctic states are sort of putting border uh, control and coast guard uh, presence in the Arctic. But it's not much of a militarization where you have military resources in the north sort of ready to battle each other. So it's more about law and order than anything else because it's obviously not been so before. But what's really sparked the discussion, uh, another Russian example here, uh, is this from 2007. Do you know where this flag comes from? <coughs> well, it's a Russian flag, that's obvious. Uh, actually, uh, I met the person who put the flag on the, this is exactly on the North Pole seabed. That was Artur Shilingarov. Uh, I met him yesterday because he was in Stockholm. And it was an expedition uh, where they put two Submarines, small submarines went down to the sea bottom under the North Pole, 2,400 meters below, uh, well, the ice, I guess we have to say. Uh, and they planted this flag here. And it was a sort of a very scientifically interesting or just technologically interesting and just to be possible to do so, so quite a feat. It was actually sponsored by a Swedish citizen, Fredrik Paulsson, uh, who is the owner of Ferring, which is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, the interesting part was how many reacted to this flag planting. They suddenly said that, wow, the Russians are trying to take over all of the Arctic. They planted a flag there, and it means that they will control uh, the Arctic in the future. I am a somewhat boring international lawyer, and you know, planting flags, you remember old Vasco da Gama, where was he? Portuguese, I guess. Uh, and Cook and all these explorers who went around the world and they planted flags and, oh, this is part of the British Empire or something else. But you stopped doing that 200 years ago. Uh, so, so this makes no uh, difference. And, and Arthur Shilingarov actually told everyone to plant flags everywhere. Greenpeace actually sent down uh, a thing on the North Pole last. Uh, or this spring uh, with flags and stuff. So uh, this didn't mean anything legally, but it sparked this debate about also conflicts in the Arctic and who would control what in the Arctic. Because if we see more possibilities for shipping, natural resources, you have to know where your jurisdiction is or your sovereignty is. So this extremely complicated and confusing map is of maritime boundaries and zones in the Arctic. Any of you studying shipping specifically or such things? No? Uh, so the way uh, it's organized is that every state uh, has certain right in seas. This is based on the Law of the Sea Convention which was signed in 1981 and ratified by most states around the world but not the US. So you have the right to economic zone, take Norway as an example, 200 uh, miles. And then beyond that, uh, you might have the right to the continental shelf. So in economic zone, the coastal state controls fishing and natural resources in the seabed. But if there is, uh, let's see, I haven't seen one of these for years. Uh, so if you have a coast here, You might, and this is the economic zone, 200 miles out there. Uh, but if you have an area like this here, the coastal state also has the right to national resources to a certain extent before it goes down too deep. Here, it is the UN Deep Seabed Authority with the headquarters in Jamaica, uh, which decides on the use of natural resources and mining. But, so it's been a discussion, how far do the different coastal states want to extend the sovereignty of the economic zones and continental shelves, and will this spark a conflict? 
And the answer is no, uh, because this is very much handled all over the world. There is a UN uh, commission called the Continental Shelf Commission that handles different applications from the coastal states, and they look at it and give recommendations whether these zones are Russian or if it's around Cuba, are they from, do they belong to Cuba or around Africa to African countries. It's the same all over the world. And also the coastal states have said that they will not or they will settle any disputes of this by, with international law and negotiations. So there is very little risk of conflict in the Arctic, uh, even though some people have said so. So after talking a lot about what's happening in the Arctic Ocean, where do we have Sweden in all this? Okay, who, how, how many of you recognize this gentleman? One. Who is that? Who is this? Yes. And why is he a famous guy? Yeah. He was the first person who made it through the Northeast Passage in 1878. Well, he almost made it uh, all the way to Bering Strait, but there he got stuck over the winter. Uh, but he was smartly cooperated with the people uh, living there uh, and managed well. In 1879, uh, he managed to make it through. So this is a classic old polar explorer. I, most of them have beards, you know, with ice crystals in them uh, and so on. The Russian national hero, Artur Shilingarov, definitely has a beard with ice crystals. Uh, well, at least when he's out there. So Nordenskjöld uh, was a superstar uh, in the late 19th century. At least in Stockholm you find sort of different, you have the Vega statue in some place, and Vega place, that was his chef, and Nordenskjöld this and that but not so much remembered these days. Another Arctic explorer from Sweden was less successful. And do you recognize this one? Okay, who will give it a shot? Awesome. No? Andrea. Andrea, yes. Have anybody read the book Expeditionen en kärlekshistoria of Bea Usman? Uh, no, actually, uh, a book was written uh, by a Swedish author, and she was so interested in this story, so I read that she even started studying medicine just to understand what happened. And it was three Swedes who wanted to go with this balloon to the North Pole in uh, 1897, the Eagle. But everything went wrong, uh, and it crashed, and they tried to walk back. Uh, but they died, and you really you, you, you found their remains, and you found the photos they took, I think it was like 30 years later. I haven't read the book yet, I have to do that. Uh, but you still don't know 100% what happened to them, so a rather tragic history. The Arctic explorers of today look more like this, and this is the Swedish icebreaker Odin, which is one of the three best research icebreakers in the world. The other two are Polarstein from Germany, and Healy from the US, and this is up on the North Pole uh, with sort of big uh, teams of scientists uh, looking at, studying different parts uh, of the ecosystems and environment and climate. But most of all, of course, Sweden and the Arctic, it's an issue of us having territory in the north of the Arctic Circle, and it is very much like the same part, the same in the different parts of the region. We have the permafrost, we have the extreme cold. And this technologically brings a special sort of way of life. If you want to treat sewer water, for example, uh, with when it's icy conditions have six months of the year, it's rather different compared to Malmö or Gothenburg, uh, but it's rather much the same in uh, Kiruna compared to Salekard or Iqaluit or Anchorage. Uh, also the very cold countries. In this, there is international cooperation, and as I mentioned before, uh, there is not very much conflict in the Arctic between the Arctic Council. It's one of the reasons is, of course, that it's a rather st stable legal system in the Arctic with sovereign states, and you have the Law of the Sea Convention regulating how you cooperate. But also one success factor, I hope at least since I've been the chair of the Arctic Council, has been the Arctic Council. Uh, this is a logotype 
we managed to order that from the ice hotel in Jukkasjärvi. And they put your sort of brand and everything in an ice block, uh, which is rather fun. And the journalists love that. Uh, so this is from the ministerial meeting we have in Kiruna in May when we sort of finalized everything during our two-year chairmanship and we took all the different important decisions that we had prepared and worked with. For example, we had a decision on an agree legal agreement to cooperate if there would be oil spill. Uh, we also adopted an action plan on to protect biodiversity in the Arctic. We had uh, opened up the secretariat for the Arctic Council and also presented a very highly political vision for the Arctic to sort of bring the different Arctic states together. Another interesting thing was a presentation of uh, a map or a study on acidification of the Arctic Ocean, which is a rather new field of research, uh, to see how it acidifies and cold water acidifies more rapidly uh, compared to warm water uh, and the effects it could have on the environment and other things. Right here you see the signing of uh, the uh, legal agreement on cooperation of oil spill. And the gentleman sitting down there is Sergei Lavrov, Russian foreign minister. Uh, the ter very tall gentleman up there with the grey hair, uh, I guess that could be two tall gentlemen with grey hair. It's John Kerry, the US Secretary of State, and Carl Bildt. Uh, you see Erki Tumoya, anyone from Finland here? Yes. Uh, Finnish foreign minister, Sören Dahl to the right, uh, Danish foreign minister. And Esther Bart Ede, uh, the former Norwegian foreign minister. Uh, so you bring all the ministers together uh, and you sign everything, you have discussions uh, and solve different problems. Interesting part of it is, of course, we worked with this sort of leading Arctic Council for two years uh, and we had many important decisions there. But the big discussion in Sweden was what on earth did foreign minister build where? Uh, and it was this uh, sweater. It's not from Norway, it's from Iceland, I can tell you. Uh, because he is of the opinion that in the Arctic you should look a little bit Arctic uh, and rough, uh, not wearing too much suits uh, and such. Uh, so so uh, that style uh, works best. Uh, and we have different success to, to get everyone to wearing uh, shirts and not ties. Uh, but so the Arctic Council is a sort of an organization that uh, keeps Arctic states together and we solve different problems there. Uh, of course the Arctic Council does not do everything. Many important decisions for the Arctic are done in the International Maritime Organization, for example, uh, on the shipping and safety rules for it uh, and other global instruments are very relevant. And with that I would just like to end with a photo from the North Pole where I was with a Russian expedition uh, in April, actually, and uh, so it was representative of all Arctic states uh, went up there with the Russian Security Council. And you know, on the North Pole, it's either day or night. So this was a, a daytime, uh, those five months. It was one o'clock in the night because the weather was rapidly getting worse. So we, instead of uh, staying the night at, at the, in Franz Josef Land, we went straight up. Uh, and landed there. But you see, fantastic sunshine, minus 30. If you try to take a photo with your iPhone, you know, they're not very Arctic safe iPhones. Uh, we sort of switched off to all the time because it was too cold. Uh, but, but we managed to take photos. Uh, and uh, they served the uh, hot dogs there. It was interesting eating hot dogs because it was so cold. So we sort of took it up from boiling water and it was more or less cold when we took it to the mouth. Uh, and also, since we sort of we asked ourselves, what are we going to do up there, taking photos and so on? So we borrowed a football from the border base in Franz Josef Land. So we also played football on uh, the North Pole. Uh, but it's interesting that in that season, it's quite a lot of uh, people going up to the North Pole. So we had a, it was a, a marathon, uh, people running up there. It was a Greenpeace expedition, and you know, a lot of different tourists want to go to the North Pole because it's the sort of the ultimate. Uh, most desolate uh, tourist, or perhaps the South Pole is more desolate than this, but that is rather extreme for people. So, I've spoken a little bit too long, so sorry about that, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Gustav, for an interesting lecture. And now it's your turn to uh, 
ask some questions from Christoph. Anyone who wants to start? I would like, uh, first of all, thank you for the interesting lecture. Um, I mean, you just finished the Swedish chairmanship in October this yes. year. So how would you sum up those two years of Sweden uh, being the chairman of this Arctic Council? And what do you see as the biggest challenge for Canada now for the next two years? I think uh, the Arctic Council has traditionally been, as Financial Times uh, rather nastily wrote once, it was called the said the once obscure international forum. People haven't known much about it. It did a lot of research and environmental work, but not so much with effects uh, in realities. We tried to refocus what they did into keep the environmental work and research, but then also when we have this beautiful science, you have to sort of have decisions by uh, the ministers and then they must be applied in reality. This might sound odd that you don't do so, but many international organizations, you have discussions and so, which is building confidence. But I think it's important we need to change things because otherwise the Arctic Council is not legitimate uh, and we shouldn't spend taxpayers' money. And I think we sort of made a shift of the Arctic Council uh, into sort of doing more real things and setting up secretariats and, and so on. And together with this legal agreement on uh, protecting the environment from oil spill by cooperation, and other important steps, uh, I think, hopefully, so that they moved it, we have moved it forward uh, in a positive way. For Canada, they focus a lot on the indigenous peoples. Uh, if you see, northern Canada is an enormous region, as I mentioned, uh, with big indigenous uh, populations. And if you see that uh, here, uh, the lady in white there is the new chairman of the Arctic Council. She's not the foreign minister, she's the environmental minister, but she's an Inuit background, Leona Agluka. She did not have electricity in her home the first seven years of her life. And her brother is a hunter. And in Sweden, we very seldom meet people who haven't had electricity the first seven years of their life. That is impossible to find in Sweden, and there are very few sort of full-time hunters, uh, the reindeer herders do that full time. So of course, Northern Canada has a sort of specific legacy with this uh, and they have a specific focus. They want to develop the Arctic economically and so a lot of focus on the indigenous peoples uh, in the north. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I have two questions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the first one is regarding the um, seems to me that the focus of Arctic Council is about the economic um, development in the Arctic mm. um, region. And um, just based on the slides and the yeah. I and mean, I'm just uh, wondering, is this the stand of the, the Council that um, mm, to put, kind of, because you are talking about oil spills. Yes. Rather yeah. than oil drilling. Yes. So I was thinking about probably yeah. just assume that we are going to drill there. Yeah. Well, the Arctic Council is more about the environment uh, and climate. If you look at the uh, six working groups, you have one doing monitoring of climate uh, and pollutants, one doing biodiversity, one doing environmental protection of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, so most of it ha is traditionally about uh, uh, the environment and we try to broaden that to also to talk about economics because I think the important thing in the Arctic is that when you see that there will be economic development and the people living in the Arctic, they need jobs, their local communities need the tax incomes and they, they need a good future but they don't want this economic development with destroyed environment or difficult social conditions. There is an example for it. There's been a discussion in Greenland with a population of 60,000 of the establishment of a, a mine uh, in Greenland. And the, that would mean it's a Chinese company and British company working with that. But they would bring 3,000 Chinese miners uh, to Greenland. Of course, how do they interact with a small community of 60,000? This is not easy issues. So I would say that the main focus is environmental protection and mitigation and adaption to climate change. But the reason I mentioned this in my lecture, big focus on this, because I think most people 
this is a little bit what they are afraid of and worried of uh, and focus on. So how do we get the economic development uh, right? Of course, Sweden is not a country. We don't have any oil wells in Sweden. Uh, and so, so our focus is environmental protection. But the oil drilling is done in the country's different jurisdictions. So it's not the fact that whether they will have oil exploitation in the Arctic or not is not in the discussion of the Arctic Council. That is a sort of the Storting in Norway, the parliament, for example, uh, that decides that. Uh, so it's not an international debate, a discussion that there is an international de debate on it. That is obvious because Greenpeace is campaigning very much uh, on that point. Don't you think it should be part of the international debate? I think it's important it's part of the international debate. But then it's, it's always difficult to, to say uh, that you have this under your jurisdiction and you should let go of that. For example, if somebody would tell Sweden that we should close down the Kiruna mine or all mines north of the Arctic Circle, this would not be an e e sort of easy decision because Kiruna would not exist without the mine, more or less. It would be closed down. Uh, Kiruna was founded, built around the mine. Uh, and that's why they, you know, moving Kiruna this, from one place to another just to continue mining, uh, because if they would stop mining, Kirna would disappear still. So these are not easy, uh, easy decisions. We are, of course, very worried over the climate issue. Uh, first of all, sort of how can we have sustainable development uh, with all the different fossil fuels being burned around the world uh, and get that balance right? The most important there is, of course, to get this international treaty in the climate negotiations. But that is going painfully slow. There was a, this meeting in Warsaw two years, two weeks ago, didn't move far, and they say now in two years there will be a decision. Uh, so it is difficult. That is true. I know. I wanted. I wanted to say that if you're so concerned with the climate change, then. And with the changes that are happening in the Arctic, then it's very logical that we should not start drilling these holes. Yes, that is an argument being made in Norway, uh, uh, for example. But for example, Storting at the, still have decided uh, to drill, but they will not drill in the Arctic, in the Barents region now. That was part of the new government contract uh, not to do so. And there's an environmental party in Norway that just made it in. But it is also, you should know, since Sweden don't have oil, it is sometimes more difficult for us to tell others to stop doing things when we can't stop it ourselves. If we would, for example, be very negative to iron exploitation in other countries, perhaps we could say we would close down our mines if you close down your mines. Uh, but it, but so so uh, this is under the national jurisdiction, and these are, and, and of course, the effects of it are not under national jurisdiction. If you see the melting of the uh, glaciers on Greenland, and the last IPCC reports show that I think it's increased seven or eight times since 1980s or something like that. Of course, it's Bangladesh, uh, which I think is, big parts of it is only one meter above uh, sea level uh, that will be hit, not to talk about the Maldives, uh, which is Mauritius, uh, which is not uh, mountainous, but the small island states. Don't, don't bearing the consequences. That the Arctic Council could take sort of a similar role as these small island states are now taking in their responsibility for climate change. Because these island states see that as their own environment is being threatened because of climate change. Yes. And yep. I think, yeah. Yeah, we, we have done so. Uh, and so at the COPs, the uh, climate uh, meetings, uh, we have really have statements and sort of showing the Arctic as, as an example of why you need an international treaty. Uh, but these are big and difficult issues. Uh, I myself participated in COP15 in Copenhagen uh, a couple of years ago when they didn't manage to prolong the uh, Kyoto Protocol. And you have big states uh, saying that well, we have so many people in po sort of below uh, all sort of levels, uh, and they need development. And uh, the rest of you guys, 
uh, you have created this problem uh, and your people who come out of poverty, now we need to come out of poverty. Uh, and that might sound a logical argument if it wasn't for these states of one of the biggest emitters uh, in the world. So you can't sort of make a, an agreement without having all the big countries emitting greenhouse gas, gases involved. Uh, so, so the problem is you, you can't, you need to get everyone on board uh, to have this answer uh, and, and it is very difficult. We have one question up there. Um, yeah, I just, there's so much that I want to say about it. Well, there are two different, there are different sort of issues here. One is the sort of, uh, you drill and then people burn and then you get greenhouse gases. That is one issue. The other one is drilling in ice. Uh, and if you have uh, emissions, oil emissions in ice, it's very difficult uh, to do anything around. For example, in Norway, they don't drill where they have ice even though it's Arctic, because the Gulf Stream keeps uh, Norway, Norwegian coast ice free. In Russia, for example, they drill in ice at uh, the eastern part of it, at Sakhalin, uh, and they will start doing that uh, in uh, also uh, Kara Sea. So from a Swedish point of view, I just said it is more difficult to make your argument. We still make the argument very clearly. Uh, and we understand that this is under national jurisdiction, but we say that sort of if you want to do this, you have to have the best uh, environmental protection standards, and we have to uh, also uh, more practically do environmental. Uh, what's the name of this? Uh, when you sort of you, you might have to study extremely carefully the environmental effects, use best practice. Uh, and so on. So I think we've been very clear on this and, and we have also been vocally rather worried about uh, Russia uh, while seeing also there are differences, for example, Norway uh, handling better. But that is more the ice issue, of course. All oil drilling and gas drilling and so on, uh, of course, emits greenhouse gases uh, wherever you get the oil or gas from. And then, of course, we work in Swedish point of view, try to be a good example ourselves, uh, but sort of emitting little greenhouse gases uh, and so on. But we are a very, very small part uh, of this. Uh, so we try to be very pushy uh, on climate issues. So uh, it might seem sometimes that we don't do things, uh, but we do definitely do things and criticize and are vocal uh, about it. And that is good clear. Uh, do you have a question as well? Uh, I guess a little concerned when you're talking about, because I totally see your point when we're talking about development and, uh, or like the conflict between development and environmental uh, responsibility. Mm. But now we're talking about very developed and very rich countries that mm. should be loyal and need to become even more rich. So it's not, for me, this is not a question about development or not, because like Norway or Canada, like, yeah. I think they have the resources to actually take care of their people without living with them. Yeah. The, the problem, of course, if you look at Prime Minister Harper uh, in Canada, his vision is to make Canada a major energy exporting country. Uh, and if you look at uh, President Putin, of course, a very central part in building uh, Russia is oil and gas incomes. 50% of the gross national product in Russia is from oil and gas. Uh, about and, the, and Russia hasn't diversified its economy uh, very much uh, from it. And so it is easy from our point of view uh, to see these things, but it's sort of in their more and less democratic systems, they have not come uh, to that conclusion. Uh, and then this is sort of, of course, we try to make get the deal, and I think that is the best way to do it in, in the global climate convention. 
uh, to regulate uh, these things. Uh, but it, basically they are under national sovereignty, so we criticize and we talk with them that a big focus on the emissions of black carbon, for example, in the Arctic, Swedish chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and had an environmental minister's meeting up in Jukasjärvi, that came to the conclusion, which we said, the ministers, foreign ministers said that we would go for an agreement of emitting less black carbon. Black carbon of soot is a regional warming agent. Uh, so that might be sort of um, one of the ways forward. So I think Arctic Council can do, for example, black carbon, which has more effect on ice uh, because it's black, you know, and soaks up heat and the ice uh, is white and crystallized and reflects uh, heat. So there, there are things we do there, and then otherwise I think it's the UN track on climate, which is the most important one. And there we use lots of efforts and, uh, and work hard, but uh, not there yet. That's why we have to work for the Minister for Foreign Affairs to be able to sort of finish the group. I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Well, it's a little bit different there. If you look, for example, the Inuits, uh, you know, they're Inuits all the way from eastern Russia to Greenland, but the Inuits in Canada, they took a program, and it's not, I'm not sure if they mentioned oil specifically, but they say they are interested of economic change. But obviously, they want to be part of the discussion, it's very important. And if there is economic development in the regions, they sort of, they want the jobs for the Inuits uh, living in that region. So we don't have a situation where companies come in, don't employ local people, and then just money move out of these regions. Because the difficult things to, to see, as was mentioned before, these are very rich parts of the world. Uh, but still, uh, if you go up north, it is still uh, sort of very different with a lot of unemployment. People are not as rich, uh, uh, education levels are low. Uh, and still Canada being sort of extremely rich and democratic and, and a positive example. So they are not always easy issues sort of to develop small communities either. Uh, in Canada the indigenous peoples have very strong rights. They do land claims agreements, uh, which means they control what happens on the land. So if you want to, for example, build a mine, you have to get permission from the, the indigenous tribe who owns the land. In Sweden, for example, the Sami are reindeer herders, and the reindeers move and have legal rights to move in areas. Uh, but you all, as you all know, know and see in the media, there are sort of hot discussions and demonstrations when they're building mines, for example. Windmill parks uh, are not very popular among the Sami either, because they feel pushed from different directions. Building of mines, building of roads. Uh, windmill parks, uh, because the female reindeers get nervous uh, by the sound, apparently. Uh, so they feel sort of under pressure from different uh, parts. But of course, in Sweden, you can sue. Uh, and so, so many of these issues are dealt with in court. Uh, in Russia, that I would say is a more difficult situation uh, for indigenous peoples in, for example, the Yamal area, where most Russian oil and gas uh, is, uh, and their different rights. They have a very old and established uh, uh, organization called the RIPON. And, and in the Arctic Council, you have the eight Arctic states, but also RIPON, Sami Council, and the Inuits are represented sitting at, at the table. Uh, but they do not always get part of, so that they can economic development in Russia, that is for sure. Thank you, Gustav, very much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Like I mentioned before the lecture, we'll be back in April with more The Reflecting Engineer lectures. Hope to see you.